Hello, everyone. My name is Bharat Hariharan, and I'm going to talk today about uh, how to make lemonade from limited labels. The dominant paradigm in computer vision and machine learning today is to build recognition systems by training on large label data sets. This paradigm has been very successful and uh, it is well known that the larger the amount of label data you have, the better the recognition system that you get. However, in many downstream applications, uh, you really have very little label data, either because labeling the data is expensive, it requires expertise, uh, there are ethical concerns with sourcing large data sets, and so on and so forth. So really, we want to figure out ways of getting the same kind of accuracy, the same quality of recognition from very limited label data. The question is how? And in our group, we've been looking at the possibility of injecting some domain knowledge, some knowledge about the problem into the training paradigm so that we can even learn effective systems from limited data. And today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, two very different projects, both of which are based on this idea of leveraging domain knowledge. The first project is in the domain of uh, self-driving cars. And this is work done by Yu Rong Yu, Katie Luo, and Cheng Fu in collaboration with professors Wei Lim Chao from Ohio State and Wenson, Killian Weinberger, and Mark Campbell uh, here at Cornell. So the idea here is that we want to uh, use unlabeled data to discover objects. Now, the idea from, of learning from unlabeled data is, of course, uh, very old. And more recently, we have had, uh, our community has had a, a very successful research program in learning uh, features from unlabeled data. So there are lots and lots of papers on learning features without any supervision, the field of so-called self-supervised representation learning. However, in spite of all this progress, uh, all this work on self-supervised learning only learns features. And to actually convert this, the, these features into a usable recognition system, we once again need labels. This is actually very much in contrast with uh, humans. So uh, human infants, for example, um, their uh, visual representation, visual recognition system grows uh, without supervision because um, language, uh, the modality that will actually give them the labels they need for their recognition um, doesn't really kick in until they're, uh, they're about two years of age, right? So uh, we know that people are able to build effective recognition systems um, without the aid of labels. So the question is, why can't we? So in other words, we wanted to ask the question, if we are given unlabeled data, can we automatically discover important visual concepts? Now, um, you might think that this is very difficult to do because, well, how do you organize all this unlabeled data into visual concepts? Um, there's really no organizing principle that one can, um, that immediately pops to mind. And that is true if you take the, the common view of data in ML, where every data point is effectively, is independent of all the others. You know, the, the standard assumption is that the data set is independent and identically distributed. However, in many applications, that's actually not the case. Data is not IID. So for example, in the case of self-driving, right? if you think of collecting unlabeled data by sort of equipping your car with some sensors and just driving around, what will you see? Well, one day you might go to work or you might go uh, grocery shopping or another day you might go to uh, school and you know, if you take a collection of cars equipped with sensors, basically you'll have a bunch of people all going to work, to go to shops, to schools, and so on and so forth. And the interesting aspect, if you look at um, what people do with cars, is that they repeatedly drive along the same routes. You know, a same, if you take any given intersection in a city, it's traversed by multiple cars again and again. 
So you'll get driving data where the same scene has been traversed multiple times. Of course, at multiple time points and with different players in the picture, but the same scene has been traversed multiple times. And now this means that the data points are actually not completely independent of each other, right? Um, the data points are connected. Some of these data points actually correspond to the same physical scene just at different points of time. So um, that's what we assume that we have, right? So we have now we have LiDAR scans. Let's assume that we have accurate GP GPS. This is actually uh, very doable nowadays. And each scan, uh, each LiDAR scan is associated, each scene is associated with multiple pass traversals. So uh, you imagine that with the, with the LiDAR scanner, you've gone through the same intersection multiple times. You can get that over the course of a week because people the people drive to the same locations again and again, be it work, grocery shopping, stores, uh, uh, schools, et cetera. Or you can get a pooling data from multiple cars because multiple cars travel on the same road. Right? So what you get is that for every scene, you not only have the current LiDAR scan, but also you have LiDAR scans from past traversals. And what does this allow you to do? What this allows you to do is to look at how particular parts of the scene look in the different traversals. So for example, if you look at the light blue ellipse, you know, um, we see that uh, in some traversals, there were 3D points uh, captured within the light blue ellipse. In other traversals, they were not. On the other hand, in the dark blue ellipse, um, the same consistent density of points was always captured, no matter what the traversal. As you might imagine, um, the dark ellipse basically corresponds to some background structure, some vegetation by the side of the road, and it always persists across multiple traversals. On the other hand, points in, in the within the light blue ellipse correspond to cars and other vehicles, and as you might imagine, they are ephemeral. The car uh, is there only momentary and then it goes on, right? So if you have multiple traversals of the same scene, you can identify points which are persistent and points which are ephemeral. So here is a LiDAR scan where now we've labeled each point as being uh, persistent, shown here in red, or ephemeral shown here in blue. Um, this idea of persistence or ephemerality, by the way, is not uh, ours. It's actually um, been explored before in the past. Um, but what we realized that now, if you look at these ephemeral points, automatically you get foreground objects. And now what you can do is you can use off the shelf classic uh, 50 year old clustering techniques um, to group the foreground points based on spatial proximity um, into these clusters. And now suddenly each of those clusters begins to look like a putative object, a candidate object. Now you can take each of these clusters and put bounding boxes next to them on, on them. So those are the black bounding boxes. And we find that when we compare them to uh, ground truth bounding boxes, um, which are shown in green, we find that we are actually recovering many of the objects. In particular, we generally find across multiple scenes, when you look at these uh, objects that we've discovered, um, these objects are, uh, they, they're high precision, but low recall. Um, the reason being that we discover, so here the green boxes represent cars. So these are ground truth labels for cars, right? So here, basically, what we find is that we don't recover all the cars, right? But whatever objects we do recover, they tend to be some moving objects, some mobile objects, for example, um, cars, pedestrians, cyclists, and so on and so forth. Now, you might ask, why don't we recover all the cars? Well, that's because of the phenomenon that sometimes cars are just parked by the side of the road for days on end, right? So even if you travel the scene multiple times, you might uh, find that the car is actually not ephemeral, right? It is persistent. 
So what you get is um, a bunch of these uh, automatically discovered objects, which are definitely moving objects, which are definitely sort of ephemeral objects. They were there one traversal and gone the next. There's also, I should say, there will be some noise in this, right? Because uh, not only because of the fact that sometimes uh, movable objects like cars are not ephemeral, and, but also because of the fact that sometimes the clustering might fail. If you have two cars that are really close by that are moving really close to each other, um, well, they might end up being grouped as the same object. If we have um, parts of the car that are sort of, uh, if that are occluded, then a single car might be broken into multiple objects and so forth, right? So this is going to be noisy. But what we found was that this initial set of candidate bounding boxes are, very useful as a seed data set to train an initial object detector. So this training process gives us a mobile object detector. So this is an object detector that detects mobile objects. And what we find is that now that we have an initial object detector, um, what we can do is we can run this object detector um, over all the unlabeled data. This object detector will make some predictions, right? It will detect some objects. We can take these detections and once again, filter them based on ephemerality, right? So um, only keep the ones that are ephemeral, right? Only keep the bounding boxes that are eph ephemeral and use that as new training data to retrain the object detector. Um, the reason this is a useful thing to do is because um, the mobile object detector being a neural network, right? Um, it offers some sort of, a, some kind of regularization. What it allows you to do is basically your uh, ephemeral objects that you identified based on this simple um, idea of combining data from multiple traversals, they are going to be noisy, right? Sometimes the uh, object size is going to be overestimated. Sometimes it's going to be underestimated. Sometimes two cars are going to be grouped into one. Sometimes one car is going to be split into two. However, all of these kinds of errors are going to happen at random, right? And as such, the neural network will not be able to fit this noise. The neural network, because of its limited capacity, cannot fit this noise. And so what it's going to do by virtue of its limited capacity is that it's going to identify patterns that are persistent even, uh, even in spite of this noise, right? In other words, by training object detector on this noisy data, you are regularizing the noise away. So this idea of training an object detector an initial model and using its patients as further training is again not new. This is just the idea of self-training. It's been around for um, ages. And I should say it was uh, very well. You self-training multiple detectors now and it's a, it's a very good uh, idea to increase uh, robustness in general. But now it's not just the self-training that's being detected here. The idea is that every time you produce these new uh, boxes um, using your detector on the training set, you are filtering them once again using the domain knowledge. Using the domain knowledge that, hey, if I'm traversing the same scene multiple times, then uh, these moving objects, we expect them to be ephemeral. So if I'm seeing boxes that are not ephemeral, they're likely not moving objects. Um, we call this whole system based on uh, seed levels from FMLT followed by uh, self-training from object detector. We call this approach modest, uh, which has a particular um, full form. Um, and when we compare the performance of the object detector, we look at this performance of the object detector. So this is what we saw. Um, this is um, a position on the task of mobile object detection. So the detector is not uh, doing any names to the object. So it's grouping cars, pedestrians, cyclists, buses, and trucks into one big class for mobile objects. Um, we also relaxed the uh, intersectional union threshold a bit because um, the uh, detector has had no opportunity to learn about uh, human preferences for the likeness of the boss. Okay. Um, but even so, what we found was that um, we can get an object detector that works really, really well. The extent that it even outperforms supervised models that are trained on a slightly different domain. Right? So in this green bar, this dark green bar um, is the model we get uh, after a few rounds of self-training. And it works almost as well as a fully supervised model trained in domain and much better than a supervised model trained out of domain. This comparison to supervised models trained out of domain is important because Usually, that is the trade-off you have in real-world scenarios, right? In real-world applications, um, when you have limited data for your problem, um, usually the best you can do is to train your model on some data that's not exactly from your problem, but from a related problem, so from a, from a nearby domain. In this case, for example, we wanted to apply this detection model to data that we collected in our home in our uh, hometown, which is of uh, which is Ithaca. Um, but we don't have any labeled data here. So either we train an object detector on unlabeled data from Ithaca, or we use a detector that's trained on some existing benchmark data set like Kitty. 
And what this uh, table shows here is that training it on unlabeled data from Ithaca is actually better. We have some follow-up work uh, from this uh, that's upcoming, uh, which uses the same idea, but all now for uh, the slightly different problem of unsupervised domain adaptation. Um, so now let me sort of midway through my talk, and I'm going to switch gears entirely and talk about a completely different project where uh, we looked at this um, idea of incorporating domain knowledge. Um, so this is actually work done with uh, Utkash, by Utkash, um, who is a student I co-advised with Professor Kavita Bala. Um, this, this work was actually published at a, a, a workshop. We didn't, uh, reviewers at the main conferences didn't uh, appreciate this work, but I think I wanted to talk about it because it shows the benefits of looking deeply at where the data is coming from. So this particular project pertains to the problem of zero-shot learning. You know, and in zero-shot learning, the idea is that there is a domain expert which is giving you who is giving you the domain knowledge. Right? Um, so in particular, the idea is that you have um, uh, a domain expert who describes categories, describes object concepts in terms of maybe some set of attributes or textual descriptions. So the um, expert says that, okay, you know, a horse is an animal that is maybe brown, it has no stripes and it has no horns, whereas a deer is an animal that is brown, that has no stripes, but it has horns. And the model is supposed to take these descriptions and then when it comes to recognizing actual images, it's supposed to categorize them based entirely on these textual descriptions. Um, Zero-shot learning seems like an extreme case of very limited uh, labeled data, but keep in mind that often this is the kind of information that uh, we humans have when we are suddenly faced with the task of, let's say, recognizing uh, new kinds of concepts, right? Um, and it's especially useful for building recognition systems for problems like fine-grained recognition. Where, like recognizing bird species and so forth, where uh, this kind of information might be easy to acquire from, for example, field types. Um, so when we started, when zero-shot learning, again, is a really old uh, problem, right? So um, back when I was an undergrad, uh, there was work um, that stated this problem, this paper from Christoph Lampert's group on uh, learning from attributes. And since then, there's been a lot of work on zero-shot learning, including work that actually analyzes um, all the nitty-gritties of zero-shot learning frameworks. Um, but when we started working on this problem, uh, we noted something weird and we noticed something intriguing. So let me explain. Our mental intuition about zero-shot learning is that, okay, suppose I want to train a recognition system to recognize the bird evening grosbeak. And so the bird expert knows this bird, right? Um, the, and so the bird expert might say that, okay, you know, this bird, well, its neck color is black, its body color is yellow and so forth. So, you know, the, the expert provides a set of attributes with uh, some discrete values like black, yellow and so forth. However, when we actually looked at the kind of data that was in there in these zero-shot learning benchmarks, we saw uh, data that looked like the following. The neck color is yellow with probability 0.5 and black with probability 0.5. The body color is yellow with probability 0.5 and gray with probability 0.5. Um, this made no sense to us, even when we looked at the data collection process, because, well, how, <laughs> How can the, you, you might imagine that this data arises because there's some noise in the annotators. You know, you ask 10 people, five of them said the neck color of this particular bird was yellow. Five of them said the neck color of this bird was black, but it seems really strange. Yellow and black are not really similar colors. It's highly unlikely that two uh, different annotators disagreed on whether something was yellow and black. So what's really going on? Why are there uh, these, um, real-valued uh, attributes. Why are these attributes real-valued? 
This is important to ask also because if we want to deploy this zero shot learning system, right? If we want to use this zero shot learning system, the expert needs to be able to provide these kinds of attributes. And if we ex are expecting human experts to provide uh, accurate floating point values, well, any psychologist or any uh, person who's familiar with surveys will tell you how hard that is, right? People do not give you precise floating point numbers. That's just very, very difficult for any human expert to provide. Um, and finally, we past work, including this work, uh, into, including this work that analyzed um, the various nuances of zero short learning, um, they found that if you take this sort of soft description with probabilities and discretize it, right, by making it just by keeping only the most uh, high prob highest probability value and discarding the rest, that really decimates the performance of zero short learners. So we found this to be really curious. Why are floating, where are these floating point values coming from? Why are they so important to zero short learning systems? So we dug into the data, we asked, okay, what is the body color of the evening cross peak? And we opened up field guides, which we now have uh, on the internet. And well, when you actually look for the evening cross peak, you realize that actually there are male, evening gross peaks and female evening gross peaks. And evening gross peak, they have different colors. The males and females have different colors. The male is, has a body color of yellow. The female has a body color of gray. Right? And that was why uh, we were observing this weird uh, probability distribution over colors. Because half of the annotators were seeing the male evening gross peak and saying that clearly this bird has a yellow body. The other half were say, looking at female evening gross peaks and saying, well, clearly this uh, bird has a gray body, right? And so, you know, if you were, if you are a bird expert, right? Um, how will you actually encode, want to encode this data? Well, clearly you wouldn't want to give a single body color value to the evening gross peak. In fact, you would want to say that, okay, you know, evening cross peaks, there are actually two subcategories within this uh, evening cross peak. Some of them are male, some of them are female. The males and females actually look different. The male is yellow, the female is gray, right? Um, so in other words, the fundamental thing that all these zero shot learning benchmarks seems to seem to have glossed over is that many categories are actually multimodal, they have many modes of appearance. And if we only force the expert to provide a single description of the category, a single description of the appearance of the category, what's going to happen is that you're going to average together a bunch of these modes and that's going to just result in um, these weird floating point distributional or distributions that are um, actually impossible to uh, collect in practice, right? And I should say that this is not just true of birds, right? So um, for example, uh, here, right, are uh, sort of three more over here, this one with this kind of um, category, right? Here are sort of uh, three modes of a tennis court. You know, a tennis court might be um, a grassy court, it might be a clay court, or it might be something that you have erect in your neighborhood on a concrete floor, right? So um, we need to, zero-shot learning systems basically need to give experts the ability to specify multiple modes, right? And so that's what we did, right? We reframed zero-shot learning so that each category can have multiple modes. And we collected this data from experts, we separated out the modes, and lo and behold, what we found was that if we now have allowed the expert to specify attributes, um, specify multiple modes, then even with binary attributes, the accuracy goes up significantly, right? So even with discrete attributes, we see a significant improvement in performance. Um, so that suggests that if we um, think about sort of where the data is coming from, right? And look into the data, we might actually find surprising insights there, right? Um, and this is sort of mainly the lesson I want to uh, push on in this uh, talk, which is that um, a key 
uh, thing that we gloss over when we learn from limited uh, labels is that the juice is not really in learning pipelines. The juice is thinking about where the data is coming from and using some of that insight uh, to get at learning signals. I'll quickly talk about um, one further investigation we did, which was we found that all these zero-shot learning systems, they use hundreds of attributes, right? And when you ask an expert to provide hundreds of attributes for each category, that's really tedious for the expert. Um, it's almost as if they're annotating hundreds of images. So we said, looked at, if you compare this to, for example, field guides um, that are intended for humans, um, they don't provide hundreds of attributes. Instead, what they will do is that they'll describe new categories, such as this missile thrush, in terms of an old category, such as a SOM thrush, plus some key differences, right? So you say that, okay, this new category is like this old category, but with a few differences. Um, so we came up with an interface based on this field guides. And we realized that we can't just directly translate it to uh, learners because while um, we know how to teach humans, a domain expert, a birder might know how to teach other birders how to recognize a bird. Machines are kind of different and they have different uh, kinds of confusions. So instead what we did was um, we actually let the model itself, the zero shot model itself, choose which attributes it wanted to uh, ask the expert. So the expert would start by defining a new category um, in terms of a category, by defining a new category as being similar to a previously seen category. For example, the expert might say that a tree swallow is similar to a cliff swallow. swallow. Um, the zero shot learner will then copy over the attribute description of the similar category. And then it will figure out, okay, which of these attributes should I ask? Like which of these attributes are more which are likely to be different between these two classes? And those are the attributes I should focus on. Right. And so by only a few, with only a few interactions, the zero shot learner can get an accurate attribute description of this new category, even if the number of potential attributes is very large. The key question obviously is how do you choose the right attributes? And the simplest thing we found was that what you could do is you can take, um, given in, if, you, if I tell you that a tree swallow is similar to a hooded swallow, then what you can look at is you can look at the sort of taxonomic subtree in which um, the hooded swallow lies. And you can ask which attribute varies within this subtree. Those are the attributes that are more likely to be important. So attributes, for example, this is the subtree of Orioles. And what we find is that the bill shape seems to be consistent across the Orioles. So there's no point in asking about bill shape if you know that your bird is new category is going to be within the subtree. On the other hand, the breast color varies. And so that is what you should ask. And what we found was that if we do this, then what we can do is we can actually get these zero shot learner learning systems to achieve roughly the same accuracy, but with much fewer annotations from the expert, much fewer attributes from the expert. So basically make the expert's job much easier. So I want to conclude now and say that uh, really, if you, there's one thing I want everyone to take from this talk is that when learning from limited labels, it's not the, the juice is not only in sort of how you frame your learning algorithms. The juice is in looking at the domain and in understanding where the data comes from. Patterns in where the data arises lead to important learning signals. And uh, if the data involves people collection, then we need to think of how or who is providing this data, how are they providing the data? That also um, serves to identify exactly what's the best way to use this data. Thank you.